Tennis is literally destroying the bodies of hundreds of thousands of tennis players all around the world, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you're worried about experiencing tennis pain or you're already experiencing tennis pain and you want to get rid of it, then this video is really important for you to watch, especially if you want tennis to be a part of your life for years or decades to come. Hey, my name is Ian. I'm the founder here at EssentialTennis.com where over the years, I've helped more than a million tennis players improve through my online videos, podcasts, and best-selling book on Amazon. To solve this problem, we first need to unpack the idea of the kinetic chain. This is how we can move in a very efficient and powerful way without hurting our bodies. So we need to understand this first before we can go about fixing the problems that we have with our technique, which we're gonna get into in just a second. So imagine like a literal chain with a bunch of different links. The body is meant to move in a certain order and move through those different links in that chain so that none of them are skipped and they all go in a certain sequence. And that sequence is from the ground up. We want to first engage our strength against the ground, push against that force of the earth, and then start a wave of energy coming up from our legs to our torso and hips to the rest of our midsection and then to our shoulders and then to our arm and then out through our hand and our wrist and then eventually to the racket. This is how the pros are able to make the game of tennis look so easy and effortless and how they're able to look so smooth while simultaneously producing so much power. They utilize every link in the kinetic chain and they also utilize it in the correct order so nothing is skipped and nothing is out of place and so they get to effortlessly put all of the energy they have at their disposal smoothly into the ball. Unfortunately, most normal tennis players don't move their bodies in this way and as a result, they have to work much harder and it leads to lots of pain and injury. Let's take a look at a couple real life examples of this in action so that you can learn from them, avoid those mistakes, and then we'll circle back around and I'll give you some really actionable advice on how you can avoid this problem and fix your current issues. So the first example, the first case study is actually myself. When you look at a world-class one-handed backhand, you'll see two things happen in terms of the kinetic chain. A, world-class players coil their body, meaning their shoulders and their chest turn past their hips, which generates a stretch and stores a lot of energy in the body, which you can then unwind and uncoil into the point of contact. And unfortunately, growing up, I developed a habit of not coiling, which means that I just turn to the side, and when there's no coil and uncoil before contact, that means a smaller link in the chain has to make up for the lack of energy and take over. And when that happens, it puts a lot of strain and stress on smaller parts of the body. So about a year and a half ago, when I was trying to compete and hit aggressive one-handed backhands without coiling well, I tore my rotator cuff. And so I have to change that habit to engage bigger, stronger parts of the body in the kinetic chain at the right time to deliver more energy so I don't overuse smaller parts of my body. The second big problem that players have is they might engage every part of the kinetic chain, but it's at the wrong time and it's in the wrong order. So let's look at a real life example of somebody's forehand. This issue is so unbelievably common. A recent student of mine set up strongly. She turned her hips and her shoulders 90 degrees in preparation for her forehand, which is what the vast majority of high level players do. But what she was missing, which high performance players do, is they turn that 90 degrees forwards, typically before the ball gets to the strings. So they're turning 90 degrees to the side and then turning forwards 90 degrees so that their hips and shoulders are facing forwards by the time the ball gets to their racket. This student of mine, if you look at her forehand in full motion, you'll see her hips and you'll see her shoulders turning forwards. But when we slow it down, you'll see that she wasn't turning her hips or her shoulders forwards until after the ball was already hit, which means the ball was really only being hit by her arm and her shoulder. The kinetic chain, the most important parts of it, the big strong parts, weren't engaging until after the ball was gone. So as a result, she had really significant elbow or forearm pain because of all those small muscles having to hit the ball again and again. Important, her hips and her shoulders were turning but it wasn't until after the ball was already gone. If this video has already been helpful to you, then do me a favor and click that like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. Thank you so much. The third problem that tennis players have that leads to pain and injury 
is they're overactive with a certain link in the kinetic chain. They might move all the rest of the links correctly, but if one of the links is overemphasized, that can lead to a lot of pain. It can lead to injury. So case study, I recently had a student who turned his body, coiled and rotated well in preparation for his serve, and he turned forwards and uncoiled really well up to the point of contact. So, so far, everything's good. He was loading and unloading all the big, strong parts of his kinetic chain, but then right around contact, what he was doing was forcibly turning and twisting his hand and his wrist. Now, when you watch world-class, high-level tennis players, they also turn their hand and their wrist, but it's done smoothly and passively. It's not done as a conscious, deliberate, forced move with the hand and the wrist. And so when you look at his side by side with a professional player, a professional player is delivering a lot more energy because they have a lot more strength and explosiveness and training, but they're releasing their hand really smoothly and gradually when you look at it in slow motion. Whereas this student was forcing it to happen as fast as possible. And so he was taking a link of the chain that was supposed to be allowed to happen and he was making it happen and when you make a small part of the body twist and turn and explosively move again and again and again and again it's going to get hurt so he was actually kind of hiding it from me he had a wrist brace under his sweatband i didn't know he was experiencing wrist pain it wasn't until after i pointed out this really aggressive movement that he was like oh but yeah by the way my wrist has been hurting me for quite a while this is a huge problem that a lot of players have with their ground strokes and their serves especially. How do we avoid these pain points creeping into our tennis game or eliminate them if they're already in your game? Let's go through the four steps to make this happen. Step number one is you have to find out for sure what's happening with your strokes. And the only way to do that is to record yourself in slow motion. It's not good enough to watch yourself at full speed because all this stuff is happening so fast that it's impossible to pinpoint where maybe your timing's a little bit off or one chain is one link in the chain is happening a little bit too soon or a little bit too late. So please do yourself a favor and record yourself in slow motion and then compare it to world-class elite example. Step two is start to activate the big links in the chain that you see are stuck. Most frequently, this is gonna be either on your forehand ground stroke, your backhand ground stroke, or your serve, where you see either your hips or your shoulders are either inactive and they're not moving at all, which I see all the time, or they might be moving, but it's at the wrong time. Remember, a lot of times tennis players are missing their performance and injuring their bodies, not because whether or not if they're turning, but when they're turning. Step three is relax the small parts of your body that were previously being overworked. If you find big links in the chain that were being too passive, then that means smaller links in the chain we're having to take over and overwork in order to compensate. And it's tempting to believe that, oh, I figured it out. My hips weren't turning at the right time and now they are. It's tempting to believe that when you bring in the hips, then your arm is automatically just kind of going to relax and be passive and smooth. But in my experience, unfortunately, it doesn't just automatically work that way. You're probably going to have to really focus and concentrate and retrain your arm to be more smooth and passive once the big links in your chain are doing their job. Step four is take off the braces because now you don't need them anymore. Once we re-engage the big parts of the body and we, we relax the small parts of the body, now not only are we hitting a better quality shot with less effort because we're moving much more athletically and efficiently, but it removes the stress and strain on the body so the aches and the pains are naturally gonna disappear.